The Samoan word for hello, our greeting salutation is talofa. Talofa literally means let us share love. Let us share love. Some of you are looking a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> I hasten to assure you this is not an indecent proposal of any sort. <laughs> um, but it is, however, an invitation for us to share recognition of each other, acknowledgement of each other, and to have a spirit of respectful interaction. So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, can we share the Samoan salutation, Talofa? In greeting you this and in that spirit of the sharing of love, of recognition, acknowledgement, and respectful in interaction, I do want to thank the Vice Chancellor, although he's uh, sadly left us, um, for the welcome this morning on behalf of La Trobe University, who is hosting this event. I want to acknowledge, and we saw the video this morning, of the welcome um, by the traditional owners of this land. You know, as a traditional uh, landowner myself, uh, this, res this welcome that I see in Australia uh, and it has become part you know, of the process of greetings, especially in events like this, the recognition of the traditional uh, landowners. I do acknowledge the traditional owners this morning uh, although the, uh, the elder is not present with us, but I'm sure that the spirit of the landowners are here with us. I also want to acknowledge all of us here this morning, um, all the participants of this uh, conference, my fellow speakers and uh, presenters. Uh, this is an exciting opportunity. Politicians don't usually get the invitation to come and speak at uh, academic uh, forums. Um, and of course, not being an academic, um, perhaps it's an opportunity to uh, make a slightly different presentation than academics would. So perhaps I can say that this presentation is um, a conversation from someone working in the field, so to speak. I thought that um, I might begin by just sharing a little about myself, because I think it's important that you understand the, the perspective on leadership uh, that I have. Uh, you will have heard uh, the uh, Vice Chancellor introduce me. There's a little bio in the papers for the conference. I'm introduced there as a Samoan chief and as a parliamentarian politician. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about that chief thing. And I know usually when the word chief comes up, you know, it has connotations and conjures up uh, thoughts, you know, they have to do with status perhaps, privilege, uh, entitlement, um, perhaps even um, if we're looking a little bit more positive, um, it could be seen as exotic. Uh, I like one definition by uh, one of the dictionaries that says, you know, the meaning of exotic is strangely different. So, but I did want to make the point, and I did purposely put the fact that I was a chief on my bio, because that's the basis 
of my leadership. Uh, Samoan society um, is, uh, is based on a chiefly system, and the chiefs are essentially heads of extended families. Now, um, you know, often we hear the, the words in a lot of advertisements, whether they be for cars or banks or so forth, it says family first. And quite often you might think family in the more immediate sense of the word, but for us in Samoa, the word family means extended, and I mean very, very, <laughs> very extended. So, my chiefly leadership uh, happened um, unexpectedly. Uh, and this was because my father died um, when I was 18, in my last year in high school. He was 53, not that old. And he had held three titles, including the title Fiamme, which I now hold. So when he passed away, all his titles became vacant. Now, how we succeed to titles in Samoa, um, there's not the automatic um, succession, you know, father to you know, the son or the daughter or so forth. The succession comes within the circle of that very, very, very large extended family. And usually families come to a consensus about who should succeed in title, um, but if not, we now have an arbitration process uh, of the Lands and Titles Court by which uh, Samoan families uh, can decide on their title holders. So, just to keep this brief, at the age of 20, uh, having uh, failed at a family consensus, all my father's titles went to arbitration and um, I was uh, appointed, or my claim to one of the titles, the Fiamme title, uh, was successful. So uh, at, the year, at the nice young age of 20, I became uh, a chief, a matai. Now I don't need to tell you, even for the Samoan situation, it was very unusual. Um, but one of the things I do want to to say about that process is that when we went to the courts uh, for these arbitrations, the court, the bench, the gentlemen of the court, their body language, the way they spoke, the way they interrogated me, they didn't like me. You know, they saw that I was young, I was female, and it became obvious that being unmarried uh, was also not a good thing, you know. So I was seeing this happening. So when the judgment came and I was successful in this particular claim, um, you know, we had a discussion about what happened there. And, I th and what happened was that there was a judge from New Zealand, who was the president of the court of the day, um, he essentially vetoed the Samoan judges on the bench who held the view that I could not claim this title because I was young, because I was female, and because I was unmarried. And the judge said to them, the constitution of Samoa ensures the rights of this young woman the rights of women and children uh, are protected under our constitution. So therefore, the position that the judges had taken, <coughs> he could not accept. Um, of course, there are other more important criteria. You know, what is your genealogical claim? What is the level of support you have in your family? What is the knowledge that you are able to demonstrate 
you know about not only your family, but the history of your village, the country, perhaps, and so forth. You know, that's a whole list of uh, criteria. So th the point really that I wanted to make here uh, in a leadership sense, and especially for women, is that when we have our rights and when the laws are there to protect us, if we don't actually use them, then what's the point? We have to take advantage you know, of all uh, that is made available to us. So that's my story uh, about you know, how I got here this morning and Deputy Prime Minister of Samoa and, and so forth. But the other point I want to make about this particular leadership, and I think you know, it's part of the conversations that we're having about leadership in this forum, are the different kinds of leaders. You know, and I hope that in coming to uh, speak with you this morning, I can convey to you this particular kind of leadership. It's the leadership that is based, you know, on the community, on the collective, um, and that informs, that forms uh, my worldview, how I think, how I operate, how I um, interact with other people. It's about that collective. The Samoan psyche is very much a collective psyche. We talk about, we use the word we a lot. Not the royal we, you people from the UK. <laughs> but, you know, it's the, it's the Samoan, it's the cultural, collective, communal we. And that we means that we're always thinking about the greater good, about the community. And we have an expression uh, in Samoan, a proverb, that speaks to leadership and authority. And the proverb is, Oleala ilepule ole tautua. The path to authority is through service. So, um, although I became a Matai very early, um, and in terms of uh, my political career, which was a consequence of that, um, I actually spent seven years after I got my title in the village entrenching myself um, in that role. Because essentially when you become a chief in Samoa, a family, an extended family leader, a leader within the village community, it is your job and it's your job for life. So seven years I orientated myself to that particular role, which is at 20 years old, you can well imagine, um, was, was not the easiest thing. But the wonderful thing about the collective is that people will recognize you for your uh, role and your function. And I was the ranking chief, not only of my family, but of my village. Uh, but they recognize it as a role and function that interacts with other people that equally have roles and functions. And they gave me room to grow and I was thankful that within my own family, there were elders that were there. Within the village, there were elders that were there. And I didn't need to stand on the fact that I was the ranking chief. I knew I was the ranking chief. They knew I was the ranking chief, and it has a function. But I would, more often than not, defer to the wisdom of those who had more experience. And we had that respectful relationship in operating collectively our leadership responsibility. Okay, how are we doing for time? Um, so now I want to move on. You know, that's the Samoan um, bit. But moving on to the region. Now I believe uh, our region, regionalism, also speaks to the collective. And most of the societies in the Pacific 
are those kind of societies. And in the 60s and in the 70s, when the different countries moving out of the post-colonial era, gaining independence and so forth, we started in the Pacific to form our collective, uh, to share our development path. I think it was in the 1970s, uh, the then leader of um, Fiji, the Honorable Ratu Kamsesimara, he coined the phrase, the Pacific Way. And he's, in his words, he said, you know, the, the Pacific Way is not a state. No, it's a process that recognizes all of us who are here, the situation we are in, and where we want to go. You know, and counter to that narrative that was uh, coined and developed by Ratu Mara, um, is the other narrative that was running about the Pacific. Uh, small countries, remote, dependent, um, there were issues whether they were really viable, you know. So that was the post-colonial um, other narrative that was happening external to what was the Pacific Collective was trying to, to gather together to share uh, their development path. And, you know, I, we all know. I mean, I don't think the Collective is something only the Pacific knows how to do. You all know how to do it. It's a natural inclination for human beings to come together. It's a natural inclination for us to... Am I all right? <laughs> uh, it's a natural inclination for us, you know, to gather, to gain strength. So, and why I'm making a point about the collective is uh, the title of my presentation, which was, is about, in, you know, inclusive leadership in a fragmented world. So what is our reaction when things begin to break apart? The natural inclination is to try and see what our collective is doing? Or do we actually see that fragmentation just explode? And what does that mean? The natural inclination of my leadership, the natural inclination of my region, is we want to hold that collective closer. So I, it brings me to the issue of climate change. This is the issue that, is really, that really requires us to make a global response. It's not just a Pacific issue. It's not you know, an issue of a particular uh, level of society. You know, it's not an issue of poor people or rich people, black people or white people. It's an issue for all of us because essentially it's about the survival, our survival, and the survival of our planet. So I spoke to you about um, the early days and the narratives that were happening there, how the outer world saw the, the Pacific region and how we saw ourselves. So more recently, two years ago, a new narrative was introduced um, into our Pacific Collective. And, it's, and it's, the new narrative is about the Blue Pacific. And the Blue Pacific recognizes that collectively, we are the custodians of this ocean continent. And we're seeing ourselves as a continent, not as a scattering of islands. Because the ocean is what knits us all together. But it's important that we recognize the role of being custodian. And I connect that back you know, to the leadership thing 
of you know, the extended family. You know, we're, we're chiefs and leaders like myself. We do enjoy privilege. We do enjoy status. But essentially, our fundamental role is that we are custodians, we are the trustees and heads of extended families. We look to the welfare uh, of our families. We distribute and share uh, the resources. And we make the call when it is warranted after consultation uh, with the family. So bring that once again to the Pacific narrative of the Blue Pacific. It is about a shared custodianship. It is about a shared um, experience because this ocean sustains us. So I won't go into all the, uh, the details of what there is about regionalism. And of course, when we hear about what's happening with Brexit, you know, we're beginning to question about you know, the value um, of that collective of regionalism. But for the Pacific, on the issue of climate change, not only did the Pacific come together, and sometimes it's not that easy to bring the Pacific uh, together, like all other regional organizations, because you know, there's the, natural, uh, the national interests versus the, the, re uh, the regional or even the global interests. How do you balance? How do you get the best outcomes of working in those uh, collectives? Now, the other thing I wanted to touch on, and the format I understand of this presentation as I'm talking to you now, then I'm going to have an interview with Karedran, and then we are going to have a Q&A. So I'm just sort of uh, uh, doing a bit of spotlighting, but then we can uh, dig deeper in the next two stages um, of this presentation. One of the things I do want to talk about, though, is the uh, global uh, context and its impacts uh, on small island countries like my own. We all understand. I don't need to explain to you. Um, you know, the Paris Agreement on climate change was such a, a wonderful thing. All the leaders came together. They agreed on it. They signed off on it. Um, the Pacific came away feeling um, you know, that something had been achieved. And then, and from what I understand, you know, even in, in Paris, it was down to the wire. They had to push everyone. And I understand India, um, you know, that was the, the big country uh, who had difficulty about joining the, the, the global uh, momentum. So essentially, all the other leaders came together and you know, made the deal with India. And, they, and I think that was such a good demonstration of global leadership, you know, where people were really working together. And then what? One year later, there's a change of government in the, in the United States, and they pull out of the climate agreement. These are signs of fragmenting um, in, in our global um, collective. For countries uh, like my own in the region, multilateralism, the agreements that we come to agreement on on a global level, is so important for us. Because as small countries, you know, we have very little capacity to influence, to impact, to persuade, <coughs> to bully anyone. So when multilateral agreements are made, small countries, you know, they appreciate what that does for us. But when there is no agreement, it makes the pathway and the navigation towards um, development, peace, security, all the things that we want, 
for small countries, it seems to us as though, you know, it's a, it's a lost cause. So, you know, the global politics of the day, the China, the US uh, discussions, East, West, and, you know, for those of you who are a little bit older, my generation and older, we, we've all been there before when the world fragmented. So, we're the intelligent species. Why would we let this happen again? And where do the leaders, the global leaders, where do they think this is going? And who has the power to change the mindset of leaders who are seemingly driving us to a fragmented state that we all know about, that the world has experienced once, twice? Why would we do this when we are the intelligent species? And what kind of leadership do we need to begin to pull us back from that big black hole that we're all going to fall into if we're not making the decisions? And from our perspective, once again going back to the collective, inclusive leadership, is inclusive leadership is about recognizing all who are there. But it also means that those who have the power to make the call, that they understand that that is their responsibility to make that call. That is leadership. And whether it does not necessarily serve the immediate interests of their country or themselves, but inclusive leadership, and especially in the collective, our global collective, is that those who have the power should be the ones that make that call. It is part and part, and it is part and parcel of the responsibility of leadership. And people who don't make that call should not only be called out on it, but they should be recorded for history that they failed in their inclusive and global leadership. Last thing I want to say before we go into the, uh, the discussion with Karedrin. Karedrin, are you here? Yes. I was asked to say something about Australia's relationship with the Pacific, or my country. Very interesting. I, um, I was watching some YouTube um, sort of uh, discussions between various Australian leaders um, on about Australia's development. One of the things that I noted was that they kept on saying, but Australia is a small country. You know, we can only do so much. And I was going, they're stealing our lines. <laughs> That's us, you know. Um, so, but I understand that. You know, it, it's the hierarchy, it's the ranking. But once again, in, in, in a very reflective, and I want to share this with you in a reflective spirit, uh, because of course Australia is part of uh, the Pacific. Australia and New Zealand are members of the Pacific Islands uh, Forum. And I look at um, your society, and whereas my society is mostly uh, homogeneous, mostly Samoans, um, your society is a lot more diverse. So of course, your sense of who you are is a lot more complex. But nevertheless, it is fundamentally important to have that discussion within every country about who are we. Because when we know who we are, we know how to navigate 
ourselves. Uh, with due respect, I would like to say that I think Australia is still working on that one. <laughs> so it makes their relationship with the Pacific uh, also uh, more difficult. And, you know, for us, in looking back at Australia, you know, we ask this question, okay, we're, we're a collective from the Pacific, but when it comes to New Zealand and Australia, we say, but those two are slightly different. So for all of us in the Pacific, and I want to say this about the relationship between Australia and New Zealand, just as the, as the Pacific Island nations are working on that narrative where they are now coming um, to the whole concept of the Blue Pacific, we actually have to ensure that we expand that narrative to take in New Zealand and Australia. We cannot continue on the way that we have been going, where we have the Pacific Islands here, we have New Zealand and Australia here. You know, they're, they're like uh, circles that overlap, don't overlap, things like this. I think if we're going to move forward in our relationship, we have to have that one circle and really understand each other. And all of us are impacted by what's happening globally. You know, one of the things, uh, especially about the rise of China, is people keep on telling us, including Australia and New Zealand, that we're not old enough, we're not capable enough to run our own relationships with China. Of course, they have their relationships with China. Everyone wants to make the deal with China, get the Chinese market or, and so forth. But when it comes to us in the Pacific, they say, oh, you really need to be careful. You should remember that we are your older brothers or sisters here in the Pacific. Um, and you have to be careful of those Chinese people. Now, I think I want to make something very clear. First and foremost, these are sovereign countries, all of us. And in respect of that sovereignty, we should be dialoguing with each other you know, in a respectful and adult manner. Because essentially, the, you know, one of the aspects of the relationship that we have been coming along is that it's patronizing. It is patronizing. But you know, most my country, we became independent in 1962. So, you know, we're 57 uh, years into sovereignty. Beyond that, it's not that, you know, we needed the United Nations to say we were a country. We knew we were a country even before that. You know, but it's when you come and sit at the table uh, globally, then you say, yeah, it's all right, you can be a country now. And so, you know, for, for, for Australia and New Zealand, because, you know, they have the geographical vicinity to us, we've been working together all these years. I think we are at a point where we need to have a more mature relationship. Because quite frankly, it's been one of patronage, in a way. Um, and there are even now questions about viability. You know, is that state viable? Is that? And now with climate change, some of them might disappear altogether. Then they'll say, yeah, we said they weren't viable anyway. Yeah, but what happens? What happens to those human beings? You know, people spend so much money on saving, you know, the elephants, the whales, the tigers. You know, and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, who's going to save the people? It's strange. The people in the Pacific especially low-lying atoll countries with the climate change, they may well lose their land. 
And when they lose their land, they'll lose their place of belonging. Just like you enjoy your place, where you belong, these countries will disappear. Who saves them? So, in short, the relationship with Australia, and to some extent New Zealand as well, is that it's been more than 50 years. We need to be moving on to a new footing. We need to be discoursing with each other in a much more mature, and it's not only mature for the Pacific, but I would have to say for Australia as well. You know, we have to become the adults. We are at a position where we are adults. We should not be harking back to the past and saying, oh, but you know, we want to go back to whatever. It's about the present, how we make our lives, and committing to each other within our collective of the Pacific, of the Blue Pacific, that we can move forward more successfully. So I think I might stop there. I think that's enough. And we can delve in a little bit deeper when we have the next two parts of our conversation. It's my great pleasure to do this today and I think that my job is really to dig into some of what you may talked about a little bit more and to hopefully replicate some of our excellent conversations that we've had uh, about her life and about her leadership and um, the very cheeky humour that she often displays. <laughs> um, so you may talked about uh, what to some extent what chief means um, and has said uh, previously that it's not about being a big kahuna. Um, so I uh, have a PhD student who attended FIMA's uh, discussion yesterday with the Women's Leadership Initiative and she said in an email to me afterwards, I want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> She's about 33 I think. Um, and so I thought we might start by digging in a little bit into who Fiume was growing up. Um, so studying your life and family, it, it's, you know, one soon realises that you come from a very well-placed background uh, when it comes to leadership. So one of the people that I spoke to called it an impeccable genealogy. Your father, who um, we have a photo of that was showing earlier, um, if we can have a look at that photo, um, also held the title of Fiume and was the first Prime Minister of Samoa. Your mother was herself a parliamentarian and diplomat and very respected leader in the women's movement. Can you start by telling us a little bit about what you learned from your mother about leadership? Um, one of the, 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 recollect, the first recollection that I have of having a serious discussion with my mother was my first day at school. And in Samoa, you started school at six, uh, but I was just over five, and my mother, who was a teacher, thought that you know, I should really go to school. So we had a, a primary school in the village, and it was opposite our house. So I went off first morning to school, and then I, I thought it was very good. Um, but when I came home, my mother took me aside and she said to me, uh, Naomi, I need to have a talk with you. Now, Fiume is my title, but Naomi is my Christian name. So I said, yes, what? And she, she said, I was watching you um, when you went to school. And I saw you walking around, um, acting like you were a, a teacher. And, you know, you weren't sitting down with the other children. And I said, yeah, well, the teacher let me, you know. And, and she said to me, do you know why she let you? She said, yeah, I know, because I'm the daughter of the chief. So she said to me, all right, you are a daughter of the chief, but 
the point of you going to school is to get an education. And tomorrow, I'm going to take you to a different school. So the next day, she took me to a different school, a few villages down the road. And the, the headmistress was married to my mother's uncle. So, you know, at least there was someone there that I knew. So I went to that school. And my mum came to pick me up on the first, you know, after the first day. And instead of marching around like a little, you know, chief, you know, I was sort of sitting on the teacher's lap. So I'd gone from the first day at school of being the big kahuna, as you were saying, and to the next day to being the outsider. And that was, you know, a, a big learning experience about well, not only who you are, but how you relate to people in different circumstances and socialization. So my mother was a bit like that throughout my life. You know, she'd just sort of pick me um, and give me little life lessons. One of the other thing that I recall you mentioning when we did the thing first, <coughs> excuse me, Melbourne Coles, was um, that your, your sense when you got your title also from your mother was that there is an eminence about having the, the title that you hold, but really what she had always taught you was that leadership is about the relationships. Um, so you, can you expand a little bit on on how she taught you that the relationships were important and how to manage those? Um, um, as I said earlier, um, my father had three titles. So that essentially meant three extended family networks. So what I saw with my parents was this constant interaction within those three networks people coming in, people going out. And because my dad had passed away very early on, you know, it's really my mother and myself, you know, who continued on. But even before my father died, um, people would come in, and most of the time they were his family, not her family. And, and she had quite a large, you know, extended families as well. And she would say to me, and I, I suppose this was the teacher in her, I'd say, who are those people? Now, most people in Samoa, if, you, if someone asks, oh, who's that? They'll just go, oh, you know, they're family. My mother, she would sit me down, draw the picture, you know, the genealogy. This is that person, this is that, and this is how we connect, and so forth. So, you know, and it was always about relationship. And what, what I also saw was that thing again where you're a chief, you have status, um, but more importantly, what I saw in both my parents was their interaction with all the people who came to see them. You know, and it, and it was an interaction. It wasn't, uh, oh, go and do that, go and do that, go and do that. So, and she did make the point to me. Um, she said, Naomi, you know, we are in these positions, but to make it work, it's about the relationships that we have and in making those relationships uh, work. And as you all know, as we all know, uh, as we all experience, um, relationships are only as good um, in terms of what you put into it. Thank you. Your mum, by all accounts, was a very strong individual. I'm told that your father had a bit of a softer side. Can you tell us um, what you learned from him about leadership? Um, isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> I don't take after him. Um, yeah, my, my mother came from a family um, 
that prioritised um, education. All her siblings were scholarship students. Their father firmly believed uh, in the power of the pen, um, as he would say, and that as a parent, the best thing you could give your child was an education for them to build their lives. So when it came to her turn to be a parent, she made education a priority. And she had gone on one of her trips and she came back and she said to my father, uh, I've enrolled Naomi and her cousin Pamela um, at a boarding school in New Zealand. One of her, my mother's sisters, had gone to that school as a scholarship student. Um, and it was an Anglican girls' college. So my father said to her, oh, and he was prime minister at this time. He said, I'm not sure I can afford to send uh, Naomi to that school. And she said, don't worry about it. I'm going to start a banana plantation to pay for the girls' education. So she did. She paid not only for my education, but she paid for my cousin Pamela, who we went to together to, to school. Um, because, you know, she really wanted that uh, for me. And I was 11 when I w went away to school, to boarding school. And I recall that when we went to the airport, all our family were there, grandparents, my parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, some of the people from the village. There were a couple of buses that came to the airport. <laughs> and in those days, you know, it was a big thing to go away. And um, my father, he wept. And my mother, being the staunch uh, person she was, she was wearing her sunglasses and saying something like, why is he crying? <laughs> And of course, I'm crying. I'm saying, well, it's sad. And she, and she would say, well, stop crying. You know, you're going off to school and, you know, this is important. You should, you know, use the opportunity well. Not many people get this opportunity and so forth and so forth. And there was my dad. He was weeping. And if it was left to him, I think I would have stayed home. I would have probably married really early. I would have probably had 10 children. Um, Thank goodness for your mum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so because of this amazing heritage, um, political, traditional, some might construe that you've been sort of handed leadership on a golden platter. But reflecting as you did on when you were awarded the title of FMA, you were a 20, 20 year old woman learning to get by in what is essentially a man's world. And I've visited that world and we talked about it the other day. It felt um, like looking through glass to me. Um, but can you tell us at that young age, what, what was that like for you learning to do leadership in the village with the other Matais? And what did it teach you about power and politics? Um. You know, there's nothing like survival to push you. And essentially when, when my dad died, you know, our provider had gone. Provider in all sense of the word, you know, um, the security. Um, so our social status to, a, to some extent. So a part of the decision to claim for title was exactly that. You know, I have to be very honest and share with you that it was, you know, essentially about survival. But more than that, it was also, um, uh, you know, coming from a family where my father was the, the leader of the family and so forth, it, it was also about, you know, a commitment, I suppose, to his legacy and wanting to see that also move forward. Um, it wasn't handed to me by, by any way, because I explained to you, you know, it's open to the extended family. It was very um, contentious, it was very competitive. 
I think for the particular title, Fear Me, there were 21 candidates for the title. You know, we all went off to court and we all got um, interrogated uh, through that process. And it was funny. Um, well, it wasn't funny, actually. Um, <laughs> most of the other candidates, if they were interrogated for half an hour, that was really long. For me, it was a whole day and a half. And it happened because, and I'd have to say, I don't think there has been any other time, including my political career and everything, where I have been so focused on anything. You know, and you know how you, for those people of you who are sporting types, you know, you're in the zone, you know? I was totally in the zone, you know, that, that whole process. So what was happening is, you know, they'd ask me a question, I'd answer it, and I'd answer it really comprehensively, took my time, explained it. Uh, and if they asked a question which I thought was a bit unfair, I'd sort of have the discussion about that, which really annoyed the judges. Um, but I, I felt that that was important. And the funny thing is, is that I was, you know, in reflecting on it later, I would have thought that as adults, they would see what was happening and they would have cut it off. But they, they seemed to have sort of got sucked in and we, we had this very sort of very lengthy interrogation um, in, the, in the court process. And I could tell that they didn't like me. And even with the long discourse and I was demonstrating how much I understood about the issues, um, so that's where, you know, I would have to say to you that if it was left to the Samoan judges, I, would, I wouldn't have gotten the title. And it was really due to the veto power of the judge uh, that was there. Thank God for him. And um, so it, it wasn't handed to me. I, I think, you know, at the time, it, it was a very unusual thing to have happened. Um, for a 20-year-old to have been given a title and a, a title of, of that rank. And having been given the title, I had this very bizarre experience where, you know, I'd been at university, so I thought, all right, we've settled that. I'll go back to university and, and, and finish my, uh, my degree. I was in, back in New Zealand a month. I got a letter from the Lands and Titles Court that some members of my family had taken me to court for being an absentee chief, and they wanted to remove the, the title. So I wrote back and said, uh, thank you very much. I'm not here on holiday. I've come to try and finish my degree, but I will be back at the end of the year, and of course, if they still want to take me to court. And we had a court case, a court case to remove um, my title. So. No, it wasn't handed to me, but I did get given the hard word by the Lands and Titles Court. They said, court went out on a, on a limb, or the Palangi, the white guy. The court went out on the limb, gave you the title, so you should stay put. I've probably been the only chief in Samoa, in Samoa who has been told to stay put. But if that's what it took, then that's what it takes. That's what it takes for young women anyway, who <laughs> are appointed at such a young age. So I know that there will be many questions from the audience, so I'm just going to ask one more and then I promise we'll hand it over. But we have this image of Jacinta Ardern, um, and in response to the Christchurch massacre, she was acknowledged as offering a vision of an inclusive and welcoming society. Speaking at the recent Just Transition conference in New Zealand, you said that it was good that, I quote, most members of the family had come to a consensus in relation to climate change. If the Pacific is a family, who or what is Australia? The spoilt cousin? The big bossy brother? And how is this reflected in our aid program? Speak freely. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how much do they give us? Um, 
Well, I think, you know, I began that conversation when I was making my remarks earlier. Um, I mean, Australia has um, uh, stepped up in terms of uh, its uh, relationships with the Pacific and, and Samoa um, through its uh, aid program, various programs. I mean, one big thing, and you know, this is the global stuff, the whole security thing. So quite a large part of the Australian uh, relationship uh, in the Pacific is the security cover that it offers. Um, of course, it then makes um, uh, investments, would, I think is a good word, uh, in various sectors, education, health, um, fisheries, which is a, a big thing in the Pacific. You know, I think I spoke to earlier about having an adult relationship. You know, when jokingly you've referred to a big brother, um, what's the other one, spoiled cousin or something like that. And I think, you know, I reflect back to my earlier comments about the Samoan salutation, <coughs> recognition, acknowledgement, respect. You know, those are, you know, critical aspects you know, of the, the salutation of love. But I think in terms of how we relate to each other, that's also where it needs to be premised. You know, to recognize they, you know, they know us. To acknowledge they understand where we are and what we are. But most importantly, we, we need to interact in a respectful way. Now, there have been incidences where I think there was a meeting here in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Forum and um, a briefing on the different leaders in the Pacific um, fell out of someone's case. So it was a, you know, it was a very frank briefing you know, on the characteristics of um, all the leaders that were there. But it was very telling um, about I mean, I'm not saying it was not true, but I think it was also in the, in the tenor of how it was presented, you know. Um, so I really do think that we've had the relationship long enough where we can sit down at the, at the table and eyeball each other and understand where exactly we're coming from. And I have to say to Australia, it's the bigger country. You've been given more resources. And what's the adage? Uh, for those who are, you know, given, much is expected. And, you know, Australia has to, to play that role. It needs to own that role. Uh, but it needs to come from a place where there's a commitment to an investment of a community that they belong to not so much as um, in a, um, in a patronising way or in a controlling way, although you know, those are all the realities of, of human life. But, um, and I think we have an opportunity to do that. And just talking about New Zealand and the transition um, conference that I was at, New Zealand you know, has uh, set targets uh, for 2050 to be carbon neutral. And we applaud uh, the, the change in policy in New Zealand because it aligns with what the Pacific Island states uh, have been working and activating and advocating for. So, you know, Australia hasn't made that commitment. We respect, you know, Australia's sovereignty, but we would hope not only in terms of our regional relationship, but also the global um, responsibility that it will make that shift as well. But one last point I want to make about uh, the opportunity. I actually spoke with uh, Prime Minister Ardern at the transition conference in, in New Zealand. And I was wanting to know, because both of Australia and New Zealand um, uh, revamping or reviewing uh, their program, um, their assistance uh, programs in the Pacific. 
Um, for here, it's uh, step up. For New Zealand, it's reset. So, of course, you know, we in the Pacific are very interested. So, what do you mean by step up? And what do you mean by reset? And Prime Minister Dern said something very interesting to me. She said to me when I was asking the question about New Zealand's reset, and she said, the reset is as much about what we are going to do in the Pacific, but even more so what it's about is our internal discussion about what we are. And I think I alluded uh, to it earlier where I said, when we know and we understand who we are, then we can do the external. You know, we project ourselves in that way. So I think it's a real opportunity for both New Zealand and Australia, you know, to, to, to have that internal reflection about many things, but including the relationship with the Pacific Islands. Thank you. Okay, we just have not much time. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs>